All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today for our webinar on power management with analog devices and aero electronics. I'm Brittany Nelson, Partnerships Manager at Indiegogo. And here with me today is Keaton Anderson, Engineering Manager at Aero. Analog Devices is the official semiconductor technology provider of the Aero Certification Program, enabling entrepreneurs to interpret the world around them with unmatched technologies that sense, measure, and connect. Just a quick note, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom and we will try to address all the questions at the end. All right, uh, without further ado, Keaton, why don't we go ahead and get started? Perfect, thanks, Brittany. Um, so as Brittany mentioned, my name is Keaton Anderson. I am an engineering manager here at Aero Electronics, um, and I'm going to be kind of going through today and doing just a high level overview of um, how to choose the right power or solutions for your product. What is that going to look like? How do you go about building it? So um, without further, we'll kind of dive right into it. Um, my goal for today is to try to keep this somewhat a little bit um, just quick paced. We don't want to take up too much time, but I definitely want to make sure that we're going to give some hopefully useful information. So uh, the topics I'm going to cover today are a little bit of a power overview. So we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the commonly used terms in the industry, and then what are some of the basic power management devices? How do they work? Uh, kind of the basics around what that is. If that's too you know, high level for you, don't worry, we'll get a little bit more technical as we go on. Um, the second one we'll talk about is around building a power tree. So I want to walk through a little bit about what are some best practices from that perspective. I'm kind of just looking at it from a, a power engineer's engagement. How do we be able to work our way back or forward to the solution? Um, then we'll talk a little bit about analog devices. So, you know, as Brittany mentioned, this is a um, webinar sponsored by analog devices. They are our leading provider um, in terms of power technology. And we're really excited about being able to talk about some of their solutions and actually some of the tools that they've provided to make it easier. Um, and then I'll go through and I'll talk a little bit about the Aero certification program as a whole and how you can get more help if you have questions. So let's dive right in. So um, I, I like to talk a little bit of, before we kind of get too deep in terms of what are all the different acronyms. So a lot of times I've, I've told people before that I work with that um, the only reason that acronyms are there that they keep the amateurs out, so to speak, and, and that's kind of said in jest, but a lot of times we see that, and I'm sure this is industry specific, but you get a lot of different um, acronyms that are covering things that you know are pretty basic. So let's just go through a few of them. So the first one is an LDO, which stands for low dropout regulator. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what this looks like in kind of a larger forum, but the, the basic idea here is you're going to be using it to take one power level from a higher state to a lower state and it's typically going to be burning through resistors. Um, the second one is a PMIC or power management integrated circuit. This is a specific device that's intended to be able to be used for um, just managing the power of a circuit and typically it's related to kind of being the black box of power. So you can be able to put some certain inputs in and if you're running the circuit at the kind of recommended specs within the data sheet or, or way paper, um, you're going to expect to get some level of power out in kind of a clean form factor. Um, PFC is power factor correction. This is talking a little bit around uh, three phase power and essentially what does it look like from a, a different phasing perspective? How accurate and how close is that? Um, you'll typically see that if your, your power factor is way off that your power is going to be dirty power or something that um, you're, it's not going to be as usable. So typically you'll see a, a power factor correction. Um, DC to DC and AC to DC are direct current to direct current and alternating current to direct current. Um, typically what this is talking about is how are we taking different levels of power and converting them to other levels of power. So in the direct current to direct current example, that might be I'm taking one voltage level and bringing it down, say 12 volts to five volts. Um, where if I'm looking at alternating to direct current, I'm potentially taking an off wall, uh, kind of you're taking off wall plug and then I'm, add, I'm taking that and I'm converting it to direct current. So an example being that when I go to plug my phone into the wall outlet, it can't just charge off of alternating current, it's gonna need direct current. So we're looking at a, a kind of a inversion there at that point. 
Um, PoE is power over ethernet. This is a standard that's starting to become more and more common. The idea being that instead of just taking the ethernet port that you're plugging in to get internet, you might actually be able to transfer power over that line. And that has some really interesting applications. I won't go a ton into it here, but um, power over ethernet is, is a very particularly interesting idea that you could potentially have buildings that have been pre-wired for ethernet. And if you're able to put enough power through those devices, um, through the, the ethernet cords, you could potentially be able to do away with outlets entirely. Um, that's obviously really hard to do because you're not able to put a ton of power over the wiring at the moment, but it's an interesting standard that we're gonna be able to see more and more being developed with there. Uh, I think the last time I looked, the systems were already up over hundred Watts. And so um, some of your basic being able to just do some levels of LED lighting and such, um, those ones can be accomplished by PoE. And then PWM or pulse width modulation. This is talking about in a square form wave, you are being able to set how frequently something is on. So um, it's very common that you don't wanna just have things on 100% the entire time. You set it for some level of a duty cycle. So it'll be on for some portion of it and off for some portion of it. Um, and what pulse width modulation allows you to do is then create these kind of switching circuits that um, we'll talk about for regulators. So those are just some of the common, I didn't cover for everything here. There's a lot when it comes to just kind of technology acronyms, but this is some of the basics when it comes to power. So let's talk about uh, Power 101. So everyone here probably rolled their eyes when they see this, but um, Ohm's law is the very basics around power. So this essentially says you have some voltage source and some resistance, um, and the relationship between the voltage and the resistance is proportional based on the current. Um, so in this example, if I have five volts, I have five ohms, then I have one amp. Um, pretty basic math there. But the idea being that as the, you can use these nozzles to be able to tweak power. So if I'm trying to set a particular voltage or a particular resistance that I may know, um, that helps set some of the, the form of what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my circuit. And so um, it's kind of just, a, again, a very basic concept, but this is really the foundation that we have to lay for, for everything else. Um, so let me drop into kind of some different common converters that you're going to see for power. And this is kind of um, when you're working on a new circuit, you're going to have some combination of a few of these is what it's going to end up looking like. So um, the first one that we're going to talk about is a low dropout regulator. It's I say it's the most simple form. Obviously, you could do even simpler with just a basic resistors circuit. But I'm, I'm talking kind of generally when you're seeing cheap easy power electronics, um, LDOs are gonna be very common. And so in this circuit, what you'll see here is you have an input at the top with a switch, um, that's a transistor, and then you're gonna have a drop between that R1 and R2. And that is a fixed voltage drop that's set between those two resistors. So that V equals IR, you're kind of seeing that there. Um, and what this enables you to do is you essentially take your input and you're able to set the voltage that you want on the output, which will be down. Um, and that'll be what that voltage is gonna be across the load. In this circuit, we have an error amplifier that essentially says, hey, if I've gone off the rails here from this voltage reference, I want um, change some things, amplify to be able to get the power where I want it to be. That uh, switch at the top will end up changing how often it's open and closed. Um, but the basic idea here is there's no inductor. You're just essentially taking one resistance and a second resistance and creating a new power level there. Um, cheap, but they are um, essentially the most basic form. You really can't go up with these because you're going to be burning them across the resistors. Um, but it it's, might be an easy way if you're just trying to go from one to another. It's going to be commonly used to be able to take just a small voltage drop if you need to. All right, let's talk about buck converters. So this is that next level up. of, And, and this essentially is what is also known as a step down converter. So what you're seeing here in this example is talking about the on state and the off state. So in that on state, in the pulse width modulation we were talking about, you're going to have the device on for a certain amount of time and then off for a certain amount of time. So in the on state, we're going to be charging this inductor here that's in the top right corner. Um, and that's going to be picking up essentially as you run power through it, it will kind of have a voltage associated with it. And there's a bunch of equations that go through um, inductance and how it's related to voltage. But for the basics here, essentially, it will be charging the inductor. Then in the off state, um, you're essentially now using that inductor to power your circuit. So 
um, you'll see in the boost circuit, you're going to have both the source and the inductor on the same circuit to get that voltage up a bit. In this state, we're just running off the inductor. So that's going to end up just being we're dropping the voltage down a bit. Um, an example of when you might want to use something like this is in a an application like a phone charger or something, maybe a USB, you'll have certain portions of your circuit that are gonna need say five volts. And then you'll have other portions of your circuit that will need say 3.3 or 1.8. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we're going through our power tree example, but you would use a buck converter. Um, they're highly efficient and they're a, an easy way to be able to take and kind of set different voltage levels. So I'm gonna switch the slide to a boost converter. Um, this is also known as a step up converter. And if you notice here, the difference is in that on state, it's gonna be charging that inductor, right? And then in that off state, when I've opened it up, now I have both the, um, I have both the power source and the inductor adding voltage. So you have two sources in a row, which is why you're using that step up state. Um, these are typically gonna be used if you need to take a voltage from one level to a higher level. An example of this might be, um, let's say you're using like a lithium ion battery. As that voltage begins to come down over time as it's discharging, um, you're gonna wanna keep it at a relatively steady state so that your circuit can know it's fixed voltage that it's operating at. Um, and what we end up seeing here is this will help kind of make sure that we're continuing to boost that, that voltage back to that consistent level, even if we see that the, the circuit may be dropping a little bit of voltage across the battery there. Um, so just kind of an example there, you, you might be able to use it if you're doing it. Typically what you'll see is some level of a buck boost um, where you're combining both the buck converter and the boost converter um, to be able to have different options so that it can be discharged at a higher level and then charge up or, or raise the voltage up at a lower level so that you can really keep that voltage consistent. As it turns out with a lot of electronics, you can have some level of um, varying input, but you really are trying to keep your voltages constant throughout your circuit for it to work somewhat consistently. Um, and then the last thing that I'll cover here is a power management IC. And what a power management IC is, is it's a specific circuit designed to handle some function or give you out some rails. So in this example, I provided a part from analog devices. And what I'm showing here is you have both a USB input and a battery input, right? Um, both of those can come from a, different, uh, a couple different manners. So you might have that AC adapter that's shown there, which will be kind of your circular jack. Um, or you might have a USB adapter, which is pretty common and standard. Um, either way, it'll accept the power there. Also on the battery side, you could either have two AA's, three AAA's, or a lithium ion battery, and it'll be okay there. And then on the output side, what you're gonna see is I have both that buck boost and then a couple of different rails that are coming off. So in this example, I have my three volts, my 1.8 volts, and those are coming at a certain power level and amperage. Um, and this is, again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the power tree section, um, but you'll probably need certain rails out for your device. And so this essentially acts as that black box, right? You don't know exactly what all is going in in the LTC 3101, but you know that if I give it the AC adapter, USB, lithium ion, I get a bunch of rails out. Um, and, and that can be really beneficial sometimes if you're saying, hey, I just want to be able to take a very specific design and apply it to what I'm trying to do to power my device. So I would highly recommend it. it's a little bit more of an expensive solution because there's things typically being done in there. Uh, there's different pieces. Um, it, and oftentimes these will have like protection and whatnot. Uh, but at the end of the day, if this is something that you're saying, hey, I don't want to spend a ton of time on the power. I need to work on my software. You know, I'm trying to develop my app. I have a, a bunch of other things going on. Um, this might be a simple way to be able to just deploy this solution onto your board. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how to build a power tree. We're gonna go through what is it, how to start building, and then maybe highlight a bit, little bit about what I was talking um, in terms of why a PMIC might be a little bit of a better solution. So what is a power tree? So the power tree refers to some of the limbs and branches that are coming off of a power conversion. So as you can see from my really bad PowerPoint art here, uh, you have 12 volts there that are gonna be coming in and I've made branches of five volts, 4.2, 3.3 and 1.8. So you'll have a trunk which is gonna be kind of your base power source. And then you'll have these limbs, which are gonna be the different voltage levels that are coming off of that. And this is when you start to see um, 
you don't necessarily crack into your device like an iPhone or something like that, but inside there, they're not all just operating on that 4.2 or whatever voltage you're getting from that um, lithium ion source. They're gonna be operating at smaller levels. And there's a couple of reasons why you would do this. Um, one, there are gonna be devices that just require different power levels. And then two, you're gonna see that the lower that you take the voltage or the amps, that actually impacts the power of your circuit. And I didn't highlight that in Ohm's law there, but it's um, essentially power equals voltage times current. And what that essentially does is if you have more power, um, frequently you'll have more heat and it will consume your battery faster. So sometimes there's an advantage to being able to run things at a lower voltage if you can to be able to then conserve on power. Um, there's some other tricks that you can do there as well, but just kind of an idea. Um, and then one last point on this is that there are frequently voltage levels that are standard. Um, I'm not to say that you know everything's going to run at the exact same, but you see that there's some commonly used rails, um, things like 3.3, 1.8, 4.2 for charging lithium ion batteries. Those become some of your more common voltages as are like 12 volts and five volts and such. So um, that's why it, in, in many circumstances, there will be power management ICs that kind of give you out what you would expect from certain voltages, um, but you'll always have an ability to be able to adjust them on those buck and boost converters. Okay, so how do we start building uh, in terms of a power circuit, right? So I, I I kind of think the best way to describe this is from a tree perspective, right? So um, let's talk about going first from trunk to limbs. So if you have a power source that you know exactly what you're gonna put into your device, let's say um, I'm building some sort of smart IoT device and I know I'm gonna be using a lithium ion battery. Um, in that example, you know what your power source is going to be. You know what your voltage is gonna be you may not necessarily have the maximum amperage that you're gonna pull out of that, but you, if you discharge too fast, your device is not gonna last any time at all. So in that example, you have a decent idea of what your voltage is, and then you need to walk it out and see what kind of peripherals you'd wanna use. So in that circumstance, you say, I have a 3.8 lithium ion battery, um, and I wanna be able to have these different kind of functions for my device. So you have a trunk that essentially tells you this is the amount, maximum amount of power I'm gonna be able to work with. Everything else has to fall within that from a branch perspective. Alternatively, you could work the other way. So let's say that I'm building um, some sort of, you know, a user is gonna be connecting with my device. It's gonna have a USB port. It's gonna be connected to wall power. It's going to have, um, you know, maybe a USB-C. It's gonna have different sorts of sensors on it. Um, in that circumstance, now you know what the end applications are and you can start to set out, okay, I need this voltage here with this amount of current. I need this voltage here with this amount of current. And then you work your way back to be able to see what is that total power level. Obviously the disadvantage in that is gonna be that if you've set all the peripherals and you come back and it's like you need 3000 volts, that's not really gonna be good for a consumer device, right? That's not likely gonna be the case and that's kind of an outlandish example, but you get the idea that um, if you're working on the peripheral side of something and you work your way back and you say, hey, I, I can't develop a, a natural source, it's gonna be challenging. But in certain circumstances, if those are features are necessary for your device, then you're gonna to have to look at how do we alternate? How do we change something? How do we make this easier? Um, you know, If you're working with something that's gonna be operating at a significantly higher voltage, then that's okay potentially, but you just need to know who your end user is, what the application looks like. So um, at the end of the day, you're gonna end up determining what that total circuit power is gonna look like. What's my voltage, amperage? What's the total resistance on the circuit? And that'll really kind of help set some of those levels in terms of where you're going to be putting out and, and the total power of your device. Um, you know, a, a, for you know, your, your desktop computers or something like that, a couple hundred watts may make, make sense. Uh, putting a couple hundred watts through a wristwatch or something like that is not going to go well for your end user. So those are some of the considerations to keep in mind. And then this last slide, I kind of <laughs> titled just use a PMIC. And this is somewhat said very tongue in cheek, but um, in some circumstances, as I kind of highlight earlier, it may just be easier to just find a power management IC that handles a lot of this for you. And, and the reason I would say that is there are given PMIX that are typically done for specific microcontrollers, for specific FPGAs, where someone's really already done the work to say, if you put this voltage in and you want this out at this current, um, this is the circuit conditions to do so. And in those circumstances, a lot of times these PMIX offer this over voltage, over current, thermal protection, things that you're gonna kind of inherently want in your circuit um, and you don't necessarily have to build in additional chips for it. So it may be easy 
easier, and I'll show an example of a PMIC a little bit later here, um, but it may be easier when you're developing your device to say, hey, can I just find a power management IC that's going to handle most of this for me? I get the voltages out that I want with the currents that I can be able to use, um, and, and that's how I'm going to move forward with my device. It's not perfect for everybody, but if you're just starting a new design for a device, I would recommend looking into seeing what's available out there. Um, you might be able to find something that's low form, small form factor, and still can handle what you need to do. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about analog devices here for a second and just their power portfolio and why I'm a big fan of it. Um, so when you look at analog devices power portfolio, they really have everything. And I tried to find some dev boards and such to put on here as well. Otherwise, I'd give you a slide of just a bunch of black boxes and you'd be like, okay, I get it. There's a bunch of black boxes. Um, but essentially what you have here is all of the different options I just talked about. So you have your LDOs, your switching regulators. This U module, these are really interesting circuits. Um, they essentially have the inductor built inside of the device. So it saves you on space. Um, and again, it acts a little bit more like those power our management ICs. So uh, inductors have traditionally been in some ways the most costly portion of a lot of these switching circuits, and they are the most space heavy of them. So when you can start to look at devices that have some level of that built in there, um, that will help save you space. Again, if you have something that's like a watch or a wearable, um, space is obviously a critical portion of your design there. Um, I went and added a couple things here through battery management. So battery chargers, backups, uh, coulomb counters or fuel gauges to be able to tell the user, hey, how much charge is left in your batteries, uh, bridge drivers, all of these I can go through. Essentially, if you're looking for something with power, it's not a bad idea to be able to go to analog.com, say, hey, take me to the power management section. What does that look like? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the additional content that's on arrow.com specific to this, but just kind of keep that in mind if, if you're taking a look for it. So let's talk about a reference application circuit that Analog Devices provided. So this is their CN0372. This is pulled directly from their site. Um, it's an ultra low power general purpose multi, that's a lot of words, but essentially it's a general purpose energy harvesting and data acquisition circuit. Um, this is broken down into a couple of different pieces here. So this first piece, I, I don't think I have my little drawer up, but that ADP5090, I'll go through that in a second, but that's a power management and power path circuit. Um, then on the uh, right there, you're going to see that ADP1607. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, that's going to be an optional supply. Again, you can see you have your voltage in, your enable for your uh, PWM, and then a switch in your voltage out. Um, and then the bottom circuit is going to be that multiplexer and data acquisition circuit and an optional buffer there on the right. All this was provided on analog.com, so it was really easy for me to go and find some of this. Um, but again, they have circuits from the lab that are used to be able to, if you needed to kind of get something up quickly, this kind of already populates all the parts that you need. Um, so it's pretty easy to be able to go through. So let's talk a little bit about some of the pieces in here. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at the 5090. Uh, I don't really love to spend a lot of times on these slides that have a lot of specs because I think they can get a little bit, you know, kind of give me a headache. Um, but essentially some key features here, um, you're going to be able to have a wide voltage range from that 80 millivolts all the way to 3.3 volts with cold start. Um, you can look at energy storage management. I talk a little bit about this here, but there's a backup there. So you have a, both a primary battery and a potentially a rechargeable or a super cap. And all of this is kind of handled for you, right? You populate some resistors, some capacitors, and the device handles the rest. Um, so uh, it's a really interesting, you have a whole lot of control from not having to populate a ton of parts. Um, on this slide, we're kind of looking a little bit at this ADP 1607. So this is going to have super high efficiency. You're going to be able to set it between that. And as I talked a little bit about this, you can go um, from a certain level on your voltage input to that V out. So it's kind of talking about that range that you're able to set up. Um, and then again, this one has that adjustable out. So anywhere between 1.8 and 3.3, um, you can be able to inset that with the enable. So um, again, these are just kind of some pretty easy devices. I tend to really, I like power <laughs> because it's pretty straightforward. Um, but again, you can look at something like this and see, here's the inductor that I need. Here's the voltage I want out. And here's what I need to provide to it. Um, this is a dual channel uh, power prioritize power path controller. Um, so you could be able to select, you have your five volt coming in, your 12 volt coming in, um, and then you're setting different voltages there with that 1.25 out. Just kind of, again, looking, you have that wide range and ability to be able to switch uh, very quickly. 
And then this one is a dual two-phase synchronous step-down controller. Um, so again, I talked a little bit about this, but this one, what you're going to see is you're getting that 7 volts to 24 volts in, and you're getting two different rails out, one that's that 5 volt at 5 amps and 3.3 at 3 amps at five amps, excuse me. Um, so again, what you're looking at here is there's probably a power chip that exists for what you need in your design. The previous ones I had shown are in the milliamps. This is in the five amps range. So significantly more power, um, but you do have an option to be able to set different ones. And there's probably something I would say there's definitely something that's going to exist in that range. Um, I've worked with a few customers before where they've sent me power requirements that it's way off the wall. So I won't say always, but um, it's definitely something that I would start there and, and then work your way to if you have to design something custom at that point. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about additional resources. So this is all great content. You're spending a couple of time, uh, minutes with me, but let's talk about what does this look like after we get done. So there's a couple of things that we've provided on arrow.com to be able to kind of set you forward on that journey. So um, one of the things I'd like to highlight here is we have an analog devices power portfolio brochure. Um, I took a couple screenshots from this, but as you can see, it kind of narrows it down. So it's a lot easier to select something. So it tells you what's the number of outputs, um, the minimum voltage, the minimum current, things that essentially help you select very easy. Um, on the right side there, you'll see that I highlighted a little bit of their energy harvesting solutions, and they talk a little bit about the battery types and their applications. Um, so it would be a good place to start. Um, if you go on to arrow.com, click research and events and type analog devices power portfolio, that'll come up right there. Um, it's easy to download and it's something that might be a good place just to see, hey, what's, what's in the variety of what I'm looking at here? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was our arrow.com power by linear um, section. So if you go on to arrow.com and click on the Indiegogo section and go to analog devices, um, all the power management ships are gonna be listed there. We've recently updated this with some of our best for consumer products. Um, so it might be something worth looking at from that end. Um, all right, so I'm gonna jump into my last section. I wanna talk a little bit about, great, we've, we've talked through all these. How do I get a little bit more help for my design? So the Aero Certification Program has been around, I think since 2016 now. Um, we have worked with thousands of different customers and essentially the whole concept behind it is taking a product from ideation and trying to get it all the way through production and even that end of life state. And essentially why I'm working in this role and why I help different customers is Arrow wants to be your partner in terms of finding those components. So um, I know that a lot of times when you're starting a new design, I've, I've talked at length around if I were to do it day one, how would I go about it? Um, and it's nice to be able to sometimes just bounce ideas off of people and say, okay, I'm thinking about, do I need this feature on my design or should I be going with this particular circuit? Um, and sometimes your engineering team is you and <laughs> or you and some other person, and that's really all you have. So um, the way that this program works is you opt into the program. Uh, we're gonna connect with you and, and get you with a member of our engineering team. And then we're gonna talk to you a little bit about what's going on with your project, see how we can provide some feedback. Um, and the program is free at the end of the day we want you to have error on your mind um, when you're thinking about how do I go about purchasing components or I'm, I'm wanting to make that next step in my design. We want to be your kind of trusted partner in that relationship. Um, at the end of the day, if you're not successful, we're not successful. So uh, we want to make sure that we are kind of being your advisor in that role and, and really just offering advice where we can. Um, what we have seen is that the uh, campaigns that have opted into the certification program raise 87% more funds on Indiegogo and are four times more likely to reach their goal. And, and to be honest with you, we're really proud about a lot of the campaigns that we've had a chance to work with. It's really the fun part of our jobs, getting to work with new people on their products. So um, if you have a new idea, anything that you're kind of working on, or if you need any help, definitely apply for the program. I'm going to show the link here in a second um, just to go through that. Um, so the last thing I just wanted to highlight on is the Aero cert Certified Technology. So this is campaigns that we work with um, that reach that highest level, that grading where we're saying, hey, we think you are really ready to kind of jump in. Um, this has the option for potentially up to $1,000 off of Aero components and services, um, being able to talk to an engineer around what you're doing, where you're going from manufacturing, and then that badge for the Indiegogo campaign that essentially tells people, hey, I've had a chance to talk with Aero and they're aware of my product. So. Um, 
it's really something that I would highly encourage to anyone who's kind of getting started in technology or a new product. Um, I have to tell you, if it was something that I was designing a new product today, it's just time to be able to kind of review my design. Um, again, all the IP and everything is yours. We're more just here to try to make sure that we're helping get people past that that kind of some of those initial hurdles um, that we oftentimes see entrepreneurs run into that keeps them from being successful. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Brittany for some Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much, Keaton. Uh, we don't have any questions in the Q&A right now. Um, anybody that's currently attending, if you want to drop your questions in, we can hit those now. There were a couple that were submitted before the event. Uh, so first one here is on certification. So do you need to get UL or some kind of certification for your product? Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, so a lot of times this is the unfun section of power that I get to talk about. So the fun section is like, hey, we get to go through our power tree and think of all our rails and our applications. The unfun side is certification. Um, so there are many rules associated with devices that are going into particular environments. Um, and they typically are based around how much power is going to be supplied and where is the application deployed. So an example might be that something that's going to be near the head or face area of somebody has very different uh, ramifications than something that may be deployed in the field collecting data in the middle of nowhere. I mean, that makes it some sense, but uh, it, it also is something that we typically have to review with people. So what I would recommend if you're going that route is checking and seeing what UL, and, and UL is just one portion of it. Um, there's CE, there's CCC, there's a ton of different agencies around this, unfortunately. Those are typically based on where your device is going to be sold and deployed um, in terms of what certifications you need to get. So start there. Uh, Typically, it's um, for me, it would be a little bit of kind of Google searching to understand the particular of the application. Um, this is an area that we, again, could help. We've worked a little bit with uh, campaigners before around this. It will be something that in most circumstances, your device would like to get that UL badge, that CE badge on that. Um, so it's important to be able to understand that um, and being able to, to essentially make sure that you're covered from that area. Um, I will say kind of uh, just you know off the cuff that not every device is going to seek that but you know I, I think it's something that when you're looking at your device and the longevity and the safety of it it's definitely something you should be doing but I can recognize that not every device out there is going to get it um, I, but I would recommend looking into it before you go it's definitely something I would recommend doing um, as you're kind of building out your device. Awesome, awesome. And then there's a question here, I, there might be a word missing, so let me know if it's not making sense, but um, so what if you have two generator sources, one maintaining a battery and then one charging the other battery? So it sounds like maybe a two battery situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And, and um, something to be able to look at with that is your, uh, your power management ICs will sometimes have, so I had showed one there earlier that had both that 12 volt and that five volt system voltage. Um, you'll sometimes run into circuits where they'll require multiple VNs and will give you multiple V outs. Um, so let's take the example of that primary and secondary battery. You may have one that's going to be running the device and you're operating off of that. And then you'll have a secondary circuit that's essentially in charge of charging that device. Now, a key little point here to make is that there is a very particular rule that energy cannot be created. Um, so don't think that you can then take and make an infinite loop of battery charging that's forever power. Um, what you, you will look at there is if I plug in the device, can I be able to then take that primary um, battery and that secondary battery and charge them? So one is going to act as a backup and you're going to have a primary source. You can't use the primary to charge the secondary and then have the secondary charge the primary. It, it doesn't exactly work like that. Um, so in terms of two batteries, look for a circuit that will have both a backup and a primary option. Um, and then again, you're gonna have to be looking at potentially battery charging on both of those um, and being able to provide enough current to do so. So um, that is something that I would look at. Awesome. When you were giving some examples, the, the battery you talked about most was lithium ion batteries. Why are those, are those the most popular option? Like, are there other alternatives out there? Like why lithium ion is like the go-to right now? 
Yeah, I, that, that's a great point. Um, there is a lot of different chemistry options. So I, I'll say lithium ion is the most popular of the rechargeable sections. There's typically a lead acid battery, which is going to be your traditional energizer or, you know, Duracell or whoever, your double A's, triple A's, nine volts, so on and so forth. Those, the way that the chemistry works is it's a one-time reaction that goes and it's not efficient to try to send it back. Um, so when you look at something like rechargeable batteries, you have um, lithium ion, lithium polymers, vanadium pentoxide. There's a, a bunch of different chemistries that are associated with that. Um, that is something that is in the solutions guide. They talk a little bit about when you would use each of these. Essentially, the the way to look at it is lithium ion was the cheapest when they were doing some level of the rechargeable aspects, um, has good rechargeability, and is something that's pretty common. So that's, I think, why you see that has been developed into essentially the giant battery collection that it is, um, even so much up to things like cars and such, you're looking at some version of those. Um, but there are different chemistries that exist in there. It may just depend on what you're looking for for the circuit. So an example being that you may use a different chemistry because you need slightly higher voltage. Um, and one other point while I'm on this, you can be able to take batteries and put them into series or parallel if you need to be able to get potentially more voltage in series or a longer battery life in parallel. Um, so that that may be an option if you're looking at like, hey, I just need a little bit more power or more juice. Um, you may be able to stack them. Uh, again, my other warning here would be on that, that there is a certain level to be able to do it. I worked with a device a couple of years back where the person was taking two AA's and flipping it to 120 volts AC, and that was not safe by any means of the <laughs> imagination. Um, so I would do your research when it comes to it, but again, that's something that you might be able to find there in the, the power um, brochure that we've talked about that could give you some base information. There's a ton that you can do on battery research alone. Just a quick follow-up. You mentioned battery life. I'm curious, like what's the average like lifespan of a lithium ion battery? And like why, like my cell phone, for instance, after a couple of years, the battery life isn't as long as it was when I first got it. You're not going to make like, me talk about Apple's slowing your device down. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, so that's a great question to, to talk about. So it's not as prominent as it once was, but um, your lithium ion batteries used to have it when you would discharge it to a certain level. Um, if you kept discharging it to the same level, there'd be these little memory crystals that would form within the battery. And the battery would start to think when I recharge, hey, I'm only coming to a certain level. I'm not doing the full recharge. Um, and that was why you would find that a lot of people would recommend things like discharge your device to completely dead at least once a month to be able to make sure that you're getting, you're not doing that. Um, they've improved that significantly with it. But what you will see is that in any circumstance, it's a chemical reaction, right? You're taking and you're using the, the different sides of the battery. That, that's why they're like a lithium ion. You have two different portions and you're using those to create the chemical reaction. And you can reverse that by applying power back to it. Um, but eventually after doing that over so many times, the battery will have some wear on it. So uh, this is a common thing where eventually you will have to replace batteries on certain things. You'll see it with laptops, with phones, with such. Um, the battery lifespan should though be something that's within the year's range, not the month's range. So uh, as an example, if you're my car battery that decides to die after three months, there's clearly something else going on there, not necessarily just the battery being bad. Um, so those are circumstances where if you're seeing that you make a device and it's like dying where you're chucking batteries after um, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, there might be something else that you need to look at in the circuit there, but eventually those batteries will wear down. Awesome. Okay, we've got a question here from Tommy. Uh, what kind of cost are we looking for a simple PMIC input three to five volts powering several LEDs up to one watt? Yeah, so the answer there is something from like a dollar to a couple dollars. Um, you may be able to find it, do it cheaper with some kind of smaller buck boost or cheaper buck boost, but um, at most that's the level that I would kind of set for. Um, you can get really, really specific, specified PMIX that are in the 10 plus dollar range. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Those are going to be super um, powerful in terms of being able to do over voltage, under voltage, so on. Um, but if you're looking for something simple, that's kind of the range I would look at. I would start with seeing, hey, can I find something for the 
maybe two to three to five dollar range, um, and then potentially increase it. Um, one thing that you will need to keep in mind with an LED in particular, and I didn't necessarily go over this, is you're looking potentially for an LED driver circuit. So you'll have PMIX that are associated with just general power, but LED drivers are specific to how you drive LEDs, brightness, so on and so forth. If you want to have dimming capabilities, stuff like that. So I would start in looking at LED drivers in the particular voltage range that you're talking about um, with the output uh, amperage that you're looking at, um, and then potentially move to a bigger circuit, but you'll probably have better luck looking in that LED driver range. Got it, got it. Um, all right, question here. Uh, does Aero supply batteries and speed controllers for e-bikes? Ooh, e-bikes. Um, my inherent guess is going to be that the the battery, I don't know for sure. I, I'm never going to say no on this. We, what we have a lot of times is battery partners that are for more specific applications. What we're going to generically sell is going to be things intended for smaller applications, right? So things like um, your lithium ion batteries for rechargeable circuits, your lead acid for being able to do you know, kind of your basic circuits. Typically your e-bike batteries are gonna require quite a bit more. Um, and one thing that's kind of a big pain and when it comes to battery technologies is shipping regulations. So, you know, a couple batteries start exploding on planes and everyone's like, hey, we're not doing that anymore. And so there's a ton of regulations associated with how do you ship batteries from one place to another? What is the, how much do you have to discharge them? What is the protection that you have to have in place? What temperature can they be stored at? So on and so forth. So um, batteries can get a, a little bit hairy in that regard. If there's a particular that you're looking for an e-bike, let us know. If we don't do it, we'll have a partner that we work with that does just battery technology that we can be able to connect you with. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm guessing probably not on the e-bike batteries. The speed controllers, otherwise, we probably will have something there. Um, obviously, we work with industrial com customers. We work with um, radiation hard customers, some of your you know, mill aerospace guys. So um, we're going to have things that are significantly higher voltage range, but we may not necessarily have in stock on aero.com e-bike batteries right now. Awesome. Awesome. OK, last question here. For people who are kind of just getting started designing their product, maybe they don't have an engineering background, but they have a cool idea. Like, where do you recommend they get started? Oh man, this is my my favorite. I get to start from ground zero question. Um, so I've I've wanted to build a video series on this for a while. So maybe you'll see content coming up on it at some point. But the short answer on this is. If I were to start from ground zero, the first thing that I would wanna do is understand what am I trying to build? Um, typically you can use devices like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or something like that to do your, your base design, your proof of concept. Um, typically that's kind of testing that range to say, do I have a market for this? Do I have a user who's gonna to wanna to use this? Can I even do this? Um, you're looking at kind of buying those dev boards, they're cheap. And they're going to be an option where you can be able to do some level of development um, and, and not spend a ton of money. So that's level one. Um, once you kind of have proven, hey, this is going to work and I have a target market and I have an application, now you're going to be looking at, can I start to build this out into a larger circuit? And one of the challenges with some of those devices is you're going to run into uh, essentially a supply issue where you're not gonna be able to buy as many as you need to grow your company as fast as you want. And that's when you start developing on some of those more, um, you're developing your own board and you're working on kind of buying things that are gonna be both cheaper and easier to procure. Um, that transition can sometimes be hard. So I would recommend you just kind of make a rough proof of concept and you're not doing a ton of development if you're planning on scaling your company at quite a fast rate. So at that point in time, I think you would be able to take the reference design from those particular circuits, look at the peripherals around there. So as an example for your Arduino, you're gonna have a USB um, type A, you'll have a USB B, I believe. So you'll be able to take and look at those. Those are gonna run at five volts at some power level um, and then appropriate those into your new circuit. Um, there's a couple of other considerations that go in there, but I would start with, can I take a board that I can use to do a proof of concept. Then I would probably move in that phase two to um, essentially your evaluation boards. So a company like Analog Devices is gonna have evaluation boards for you to be able to test their chips. So go in, 
find the boards that are going to work for you in terms of what pieces you'll need, those PMIX, things like that. Add those to your circuit, use those as your power to test and prove it out. Um, and then piece by piece, you're going to move into kind of developing your own circuit. And that will help a ton with both procurement issues during the lifetime of it, um, as well as being able to then have something that's your own independent IP so that you can start to iterate on that. So start with something, make a proof of concept. That's your week one, week two, can I do it? Then turn a little bit and start to look at how do I use evaluation boards? How do I use reference designs? Um, to be able to build my device. And I think that'll save you a ton of time over the long run. Awesome. Thank you, Keaton. All right. That just about wraps up our Q&A. Um, if you guys still have any questions, I recommend joining the Aero Certification Program. It's totally free. You can gain access to an engineering review with an expert at Aero, just like Keaton. Uh, to join, just visit our landing page, enterprise.indiegogo.com slash Aero. Fill out a quick form and someone from Aero will be in touch. Uh, thank you so much, Keaton, for hosting and answering all of our questions today. And thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. Uh, that'll do it. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, Keaton. All right. Bye, bye everyone.